Okay, welcome back uh, after the break. So Lucy's um, request is to, can you just summarize the introduction, please? <clears throat> so can anyone uh, summarize the introduction, what we said about revival? What is revival? Anyone? Can you please pass the mic on to him? Bringing back uh, death from life. Yo, you need to speak bringing loudly. Back, I can't hear you. Huh? Bringing back death from life. Okay, revival is uh, uh, bringing back something that is dead or dormant, bringing back to life. Okay, what else we spoke about revival? Renewing. Sorry? Renew, renewing. Renewing, yeah. okay. What did we speak about revival? It's bringing back from dead. What else did we look at revival? Revival is God's, ar God's arrival. Okay, what is revival? Revival happens when God intervenes in an unusual and supernatural way, in a way that hasn't been experienced or seen before. Okay, so we're saying that revival is when. Okay, please listen up. Okay, is revival is when you no know, uh, bringing something back from death to life, something that is dormant, bringing it back. Revival happens when God ex intervenes in unusual, supernatural way, in a way that hasn't been seen or experienced before. But revival always echoes what has occurred or happened in the Book of Acts or in the early church. Okay, and we also said that revival is when we experience God's presence and power in a fresh way. Okay, and what do we call that? Visitation. Yes, we call that as a visitation where God Himself is coming to us, where God Himself is meeting us in a special way. And when He comes and visits us and meets us in a special way, it does not just become something that is an occasion, something that we experience in a day, in a week, a month, or till the revival lasts, but it is something that is a way of life. It's a new way of living. Okay. It's an amazing experience uh, that, you know, becomes a lifestyle. It's not something that is an amazing experience that we experience and then we go back to our usual way of life. But it's something that an amazing experience that becomes a lifestyle, that becomes the way that we live. Is that door closed? Okay. So we are saying that when a revival happens, when there's a visitation of God, you know, God comes to stay with us. You know, uh, it becomes a place where God is, uh, his habitation is with us. His dwelling place is with us. Um, us okay so he's he's dwelling in our midst and people can see and experience his presence and his glory in a very tangible real way they experience it like they have never experienced before and this revival that brings about the visitation of god also leads to a move of god which means that you know we see that god moving people okay to affect the community to transform their community uh, the society their uh, their uh, city their state their nation and the nations of the world and that is the full effect of revival so uh, how do you know that hey and how do you call something as a revival it's not just when you see the visitation of the power and the presence of God, the glory of God manifested in unusual, powerful ways, but also there is a move of God, okay? When you see God affecting the community, you see your community just affected, the society, the nation, the nation of the world affected, that is the full effect of what revival is, okay? And... Um, we see that uh, revival is when God moves supernaturally and it's beyond human efforts. 
It's, so it's not our agendas, it's not our plan, it's not our efforts, but it is God coming in his presence and power in a new, fresh, powerful way, completely transforming our communities and our nations around us. And so the result of revival, we said, is that, you know, people are touched, lives are transformed, and there's a lot more of evangelization, there's a lot more of missions, and there's a lot more of fulfilling the Great uh, Commission. Okay? So that is what is a summary of um, the introduction. Does that help, Lucy? Okay. Thank you. So we'll move to Chapter 1. Okay? So when we were when we are looking at uh, and we're talking about revival and God coming and moving in our midst, we're saying that it's not a single event. Okay, we're talking about God coming and changing things, changing the way things are done in our midst. And the change does not last for a day, a week, a month, or a year, but the change is for good. Okay. So from now on, things are going to be different. We look at things differently. We live from a different perspective. And uh, our lifestyle also changes. And um, uh, we are able to manifest, you know, uh, um, God's glory. We're able to express our faith. And that is going to be a new level that God takes us. Okay, so it's a new level that he's taking us from glory to glory, we say, right? So from one level of glory to another level of glory. Okay, so in chapter one, there is a quote from Duncan Campbell. Duncan Campbell was used uh, by God for the revival in Scotland, uh, which happened in 1949 to 1952. So what does he say revival is? Please look at your uh, textbook. Yes, uh, he says revival is a community saturated with God. That means what? People satisfied with God? Can we ever be satisfied with God? What does it mean? People, uh, revival is a community saturated with God. What does that mean? Filled with the presence of God. People who are fully consumed, you know, fully carrying the presence of God wherever they are, wherever they go. Okay, so he says that is revival. Revival is not like a, an excitement. Revival is not just say, great signs, healings, and uh, wonders and miracles that have happened. But it's people who are fully consumed. They're fully passionate about uh, God, the love for God, the presence of God, hungry and thirsting for more of God. And they're carrying his presence wherever they are. So in revival, you know, that should be our pursuit. You know, that should be our pursuit. What should be our pursuit in revival? When I say that should be our pursuit, what should be our pursuit? Yes, God's presence. Okay. What should be our pursuit? Come on. In revival, what should be our pursuit? Huh? God's character, okay? Presence and carrying God's presence, yes. To be consumed by God's presence, yes. Thank you, Andrew and Lucy, okay? So revival is pursuing God himself, okay? It's not about pursuing experiences. Please listen carefully. Revival is not pursuing experiences. It's not pursuing healing signs, wonders, and miracles. That is not what we are pursuing. But we are pursuing the very presence of God. It is we are desiring an intimacy with God. Okay. So when we think about the word intimacy, you know, we think about the relationship between a husband and a wife, a very close, intimate relationship. Okay. So we are... Uh, pursuing the presence of God, we are pursuing a love for God, we are pursuing intimacy with God. And when we are pursuing the presence and when we are pursuing that intimacy with God, all the other things follows naturally. Like Matthew chapter 6, the last verse that says, 
what does Matthew chapter 6, the last verse say? Seek ye first the kingdom of God and all of and his righteousness, and all of these things shall be added to you. So the beginning of his chapter says, Why do you worry about the clothes you wear, the food that you eat, blah, 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 blah. You know, and then coming to, you know, seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all of these things will be added to you. So the same way with revival. Revival is not like, God, I want the supernatural. I want to see healing, mighty signs, miracles, wonders, like you did in the early church. And then this revival, that revival. Actually, revival is birthed out of an intimacy with God, a deep craving, a deep passion, a deep longing to be with God, just desiring for his love, desiring for his presence, just soaking in his uh, presence, you know. Uh, just just being loved, just being caught up in his um, uh, presence. And out of that flows all of these things. Okay, Out of that flows all of these things. So if you look at men and women of God in our world today who are doing flowing in mighty science, miracles, and wonders, it's not that God is partial. God is not a partial God. We read that as Titus and in the book of Romans, you know. But it's because these people are not pursuing those healings and the supernatural. They are, their heart is just desiring for God. They are hungry for uh, God. Okay. So out of all of those things flows science, miracles, and wonders. Okay. Um, and that is when we experience God's power. Now look at what Lou, uh, Lou Ingle says about revival. What does he say about revival? Revival is God's arrival, okay? It's God's arrival. So it, uh, what does it mean? It is with the presence of God that revival comes, okay? So when we are praying for revival, we are praying actually for more of God himself. We are not praying for more signs, miracles, and wonders. We are praying for more of God. So people, in the time of revival, what is happening to people? They're actually searching for healing miracles, but what happens when they come for revival meetings? Yes, Sister, life transformation. Thing. Yes, their their lives are transformed, right? Or there is a deep uh, stirring in, and uh, you know, they're in the holy presence of God, and they're looking at their own sinfulness, their unrighteousness, and they're crying out to God and asking God for forgiveness and to save them. And they're repenting of their sins, and those who are not born again are born again. Those who are born again and gone backslided, you know, they come back. Those who are born again and not necessarily backslided, but become lukewarm, you know, uh, kind of happy where they are spiritually. They are, you know, they uh, there's a there's a deep stirring that God you know I have not craved for you I have not been passionate about you I have not been intimate and longing for um, you okay so uh, when we are pursuing revival we are basically we are hungry and thirsting for more of God for more of the knowledge of who God is right so when revival happens God is coming in his fullness means he's pouring out his love he's pouring out his forgiveness his goodness his grace his mercy so you know when we meet for worship and all of those times you know there is very less of miracles that we see or science miracles I mean in a sense there are miracles that happen but there is God just touching us in our inner depths of our heart, God just pouring out his love, or we are just tasting his goodness, or we are just experiencing his faithfulness and his, uh, his love for our um, lives, okay? So, you know, it's, it's, uh, we are hungering and thirsting for more and more of the knowledge of who God is, and for a deeper relationship with God, and for a deeper experience of his love, his power, his goodness, his... Uh, his awesomeness, his faithfulness, all of those things is what we are pursuing in revival. And there is no limit for God. Amen? He's, uh, he's a God who's an infinite God. So there is no point that we can say, okay, I think I know all that there is to know about God. We can never come to that place where we can say, hey, you know, I know, I think I know all that is, you know, is there to know about God. We can never come to that place okay so we need to or we should be continually hungering and thirsting for more of god pursuing god 
uh, is having a desire for more of God, knowing him more and more, knowing uh, him for what he wants to reveal of more of himself to us. So there is more of God that we can learn, but it all depends upon our heart. Okay, It depends upon where our heart is. It depends upon what we are longing for in our heart. What is the posture that I'm coming before God? Am I coming before him because I want answers to prayer, because I want healing, because I want deliverance, because I want, uh, you know, him to do move through, break, uh, you know, bondages or uh, give me a breakthrough. Or you're just coming because you're so hungry for God. You want to know him more. Or you're just saying, hey, I'm happy where I am with God. You know, I'm satisfied with my life. You know, whatever time I spend, like a ritual, you know, just reading the scripture, praying. Well, I'm doing my routine. I'm happy with that. You know, that's good. Or you're saying, you know, God, I want more of you. I'm pursuing more of you. I want to come to that place where I'm so intimate uh, with you. And, you know, that coming to that place this is, is, is a sacrifice. Yes or no? You know, when we are looking for more of God, it's a sacrifice because you sacrifice your time, entertainment, giving up so many things because you want to receive more of God. It's a sacrifice that you make. And we know that sacrifice is not is sacrifice easy. No, sacrifice is not easy. It's not going to come to us easy. Okay. So uh, we'll see how sacrifice is so integral in all of the revival stories that have happened throughout history. Okay. And you've learned, you've heard some of them uh, last week in your orientation week. You saw the sacrifices those people made. Okay. So God, yes, promises his presence. He has promised his presence. He promised us that he will always be with us, that he will always dwell with us, and that he will move in our midst. But when we are calling for revival or when we want revival, we are saying we want so much more of that. We want 100 times of more that we are really pursuing God or we are intimate for him or knowledge of him or understanding of him or what we are experiencing of him. We want 100 times more of that or 1,000 times more of that, 10,000 times more of that, a greater measure. We don't want to experience what we are experiencing God so far, but we want to experience him with all of his glory, all of his fullness. And that is, you know, God is awesome, right? He's, uh, we use awesome for any and everything. The food is awesome. The weather is so awesome. I think that word is so misused, you know. I think nothing is more awesome than God's presence. Nothing is more awesome than God's love. And I, I use that word exclusively only for God. Because I think that word go awesomeness goes only with God. Nothing else. The weather can never be awesome. The food can never be awesome. Because, you know, there is nobody more awesome than the God that we uh, serve. And his thoughts towards us and what he thinks and his plans and what he has for us. His move is so awesome. And the word of God says that God is more awesome than all who surround him right so then he's i think that word should be exclusively just going only with um with god anyways uh, you got carried away with that okay so you know we're, we're saying god we want so much more of your uh, the measure of what we have just experienced of you and that is revival revival is when we are experiencing you know thousand times more than what we have experienced of god okay i all uh Familiar with any revival stories? Uh, can you share some revival stories where you seen that God's presence was so different during that revival than what people or what we experience every day in our lives or when we meet as a church? Anyone likes to share any revival story that you have seen where the move of God was so great, so much more greater than what we experience in an everyday level in our lives or, you know, even in our churches every Sunday or when we meet. Anyone wants to share any revival? Anyone from the online? So I see none of you are uh, revivalists. <laughs> none of you like... Amen. Please pass the mic. Thank you.
what general uh, uh, one of the types of actions could be the aim for person is having this process. During the primary of time, who transforms into primary? Then so people stop robbing me or stealing. So all these things stop drinking. So many things, the vices of society are already affected. So it's all drastic thing. Yes, people could sense uh, that. Did you hear um, Sanjay? Online students, no volume. And now it's on. Can you repeat that, so, please? Uh, during the when we are studying uh, God's generals, one of uh, we're studying one of the uh, God's uh, chosen ones. So. During the revival, uh, the, the, there's so much of transformation in the town. People stop stealing, people stop lying, uh, people stop drinking. So many of the ills or vices of society that was predominant at that time, they all uh, were reduced drastically. And so that was, uh, uh, you know, uh, the, uh, the talk of the town during that revival. Yes, thank you. Uh, anything else? How was God's presence different from what we experience every day or in the church? From what uh, revival stories that you have seen? You remember uh, I, I, I spoke about Maria Woodworth Eta, right? So what did God show her in that vision that she had? That when she goes and shares the word of God even as a woman, what would happen? What does she see? What does she see in the vision? She sees, uh, you know, a stalk of grain, you know, just falling down, right? So God says that when you preach, you know, people will just fall down, people will be convicted, uh, people's lives will be uh, transformed. And uh, did that happen? Yes. So, you know, every time she preached, you know, the, the, not only the, 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 the place where she was preaching, that people could experience the power of God, but also in the, uh, uh, the radius around the, the place where she was ministering in that the community, that society, and also in the city, people could experience the glory, the power, and the move of God. So is that unusual? Or does it happen every day? What happens when a pastor is preaching on a Sunday? What? Come on. Is that unusual? That happened? Yes? No? Yes. Yes, thank you. Yes, it was unusual, right? And when it happened the first time when she preached, she just preached to her own um, family and to her own small community, neighbors and all. There was such a powerful move of God. People were just repenting. People were running out, you know, crying and repenting of their uh, sins. And what did the neighbor, neighboring town pastors do? What did they do? They called Maria and said, come, we also need revival in our church, right? And there was such massive move of God that people in, in, in thousands were you know, um, uh, uh, repenting, turning to God. And there were such mighty signs, miracles and wonders that resulted as a as a outflow of that revival that happened. Yes or no? So unusual miracles that uh, had taken place. You know, people with cancer, the last stages of cancer, almost dying. People thought even before they would come and Maria would pray for them. You know, they would die, but they were uh, healed. And in, in matter of weeks, people looking like skeleton because of uh, cancer were restored to wholeness and uh, strength. So is that something that is unusual that happened? Yes, when you listen to all of those uh, gods general, do you think that was ha something that happened every, uh, in, usually in the churches? No, it was something that was an unusual presence of God that happens uh, during revival, right? So we see that, uh, you know, when revival happens, we see something that is unusual, not something that happens every day around us. Yes, we long for, all of us long for signs, miracles, and wonders for more of healing of God's power to be revealed. But that is not necessarily what, you know, we are seeing all the time around us. Yes or no? That's not something that we're experiencing every time we meet in church. Yes, we experience the move of God, 
but not mighty great signs, miracles, and wonders. But when revival gatherings happen, you know, all of these things happen in greater measure because there's a great power of God. And when their preaching happens, there's a great sign of conviction. People are convicted in great numbers. There's a change in the atmosphere. You know, um, people are just repenting of their sins, like the revival that happened in Acts. Right after the Pentecost, when P Peter preached a sermon, how many of them were convicted and accepted Jesus? 3,000, right? So, and people can, in revival, feel the tangible presence of that Holy Spirit in that place. And that is how the presence of God is different. Yes, we all as believers carry God's presence all the time. But in revival, and when there is a visitation of God, the presence of God is 100 times more. Or we can't even say 100 times. It's, it's much, much more, you know, infinite times more than what we see and what we experience in our everyday life. Okay. So now talking about this, we're actually looking at revival as, you know, also being a part of embodying, embodying Christ and who Christ really is. It is as an embodiment of who Christ really is. Okay. So let's read two scripture passages here. Hebrews chapter 1 verse 3 and John chapter 2 verse 11. So can some of one of you read Hebrews chapter 1 verse 3 and someone else can read John chapter 2, verse 11. All of you with me, uh, am I going too fast? You're able to understand? It's basically quite a repetition what I'm saying. Yes? Okay, so can somebody read Hebrews 1, 3, please? And someone else read John chapter 2, verse 11. Hebrews 1, chapter 1 and 3. Who being the brightness of his glory and the experience image of his person and upholding all things by the word of his power, when he had by himself purged our sins, sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. Amen. Thank you, Lucy. Can someone else read John chapter 2 verse 11, please? Amen. So here we are seeing how Jesus was carrying the, the power of God how, or how the power of God was manifested through Jesus and how he was embodying the glory of God in his everyday life. So in, in Jesus, we see the glory of God, the power of God just being manifested in such a great measure. Okay, so when we are pursuing more of God, when we are pursuing intimacy with God, we are basically pursuing the life of Christ, or we're basically pursuing who Jesus is, and we are, you know, coming to a place where we want to be like Him. Okay, we want to manifest Him, we want to reveal Him, we want to represent Him, we want to represent Him here on this earth. So it means for us to be. What does it mean for us to be more like Christ? It is. It means for us to be a people who manifest the glory of God in the way that we live and the way that we do our, and the way that we live our lives and the way that we do things uh, in our lives. Now, what is the meaning of the glory of God? What does it mean, the glory of God? I thought you Christology, right? What is, when I, I remember I said, what is the meaning of the manifesting the glory of God? Two things. Yes, thank you. Thank you, um, Nelson. Okay. Who God is and what he does. Okay. So when we're saying that manifesting the glory of God, it's basically manifesting who God is and what he does. So when Jesus came on the earth, he manifested the glory of God, which means, you know, he manifested who God is and what he does. Who God is means? What does it mean? Who God is means? His nature, yes. As His nature attributes, and character. His yes, thank you. And what God does means? The signs, miracles and wonders. So when we manifest the glory of God, we are manifesting basically the fruit of the Spirit. 
We're manifesting who God is. And what he does, we're manifesting the gifts of the Spirit. Amen? Okay? So don't forget that. Manifesting the glory of God is basically, we're manifesting the very nature of God. Who God is and what he um, does. Okay? Uh, so, uh, what do we mean when we say that we want to be like Christ, so we want to manifest the glory of God? We're basically saying that we want to reveal the character of God in our through our lives, that is the nature of God, and we want to manifest or we want to reveal the power of God, what he does in and through our lives. Okay, So it was uh, through Christ that the church was birthed. Okay? It was Christ to birth the church. And every believer is to be like Christ. Okay, What is the end result of our salvation? What is the Holy Spirit trying to do in our lives? Co yes, conform us to the image of Christ, to make us more like Christ, uh, it, to be more uh, in Christ's likeness. So each of us are supposed to be like Jesus. Okay, so the church as a whole, as a collective body, is to be manifesting or is to be reflecting who Christ is. And as individuals, as well as a community of believers, we are to reflect who Christ is. Okay, so both of these aspects of revealing who God is, you know, and doing what uh, God does is actually carrying the glory of God. It's manifesting the glory of God. Let's look at two more scripture references. Uh, someone can please read 1 John chapter 2 verse 6 and someone else can read 1 John chapter 2 4 verse 14. 1 John 2 6, 1 John 4 17. He who stays, he abides in him, ought himself also to walk just as he walked. Amen. 1 John 4 17. Somebody can read that please. Read 1 John 4 17. 1 4 17. Can you keep the mic close, please? Yeah. Okay. By this love, by this, by this love perfect with us, so that we, we may have confidence for the day of judgment, because as he is, so also are we is this world. Yes, so love has been perfected among us in this, that we have boldness on the day of judgment, because as he is, so are we in this world. So what are these both these passages, passages saying? What are both of these passages telling us? As he is, we are supposed to be like him, yes. So as believers, what is he saying? We are supposed to be like Christ, like Jesus. And our final goal is to be like Jesus, okay, as uh, uh, individuals and as a church, okay? Look at what Psalm 85 verse 6 says. Can somebody read that, please? Psalm 85 verse 6. Will you not receive us again, that your people may rejoice in you? Will you not revive us again, that your people may rejoice in you? Okay. Now, this Psalms 85, the prayer of, uh, prayer of the psalmist uh, is, is people, what is the prayer that he's praying here? That people should be revived. So that people, when they're revived, what will they do? They will rejoice in God. Now, Psalm 85 is a prayer for restoration and revival. Okay. Now, this psalm reflects a time, the period of um, uh, is Israel's history uh, when they were experiencing um, distress and hardship, uh, most likely after returning from exile. They were exiled to Babylon. Okay, so they come back to Jerusalem. They're experiencing some troubles, some hardships. And so the psalmist is recalling uh, God's past acts of deliverance, what he has done in the past, and he's expressing his hope that God he will show his favor once again to his people. Or God will show his face, or God will show his goodness, God will show his mercy once again to his 
people. So if you look at most of Old Testament history, the Israelites were facing what of God? What aspect of God they were facing mostly? Yes, the anger, the wrath of um, God. Why did they experience the anger and the wrath of God? Disobedience, rebellion. Yes. Idolatry, okay. Disobedience, anything else? Okay, murmuring, always grumbling and murmuring. Yes, you know, because they rejected God. Right? Basically, the whole thing, all of this sums up in that word rejection. They rejected God. God loved them. God was pursuing them like a passionate lover. Okay? And here was these people who were rejecting God. But when they come back to God, what does God do? When they come back to God, what does God do? He revives them, right? He restores them. So we see the heart of love for God. We see he's such a passionate lover, right? Because he receives, he restores and, you know, he revives them again. And they come, uh, he does that when they come to a place of repentance, okay? So where there is repentance, where there's a cry for forgiveness is when revival comes, okay? So we said revival comes when we are pursuing intimacy with God, hungry for more and more and more of God, not satisfied because he's so infinite. And also revival comes when people are crying out for forgiveness. Okay, they're crying out for a move of God. They're crying out for forgiveness and uh, you know deliverance from bondage. So when we humble ourselves, when we come to God confessing our sins, is where we allow God you know, to bring us to a place of restoration, right? To a place of revival. And... Um, if we cannot recognize our need for God, if we cannot recognize that there is, you know, parts in our lives that needs to be surrendered, that needs to be to, uh, to be submitted, to come under His Lordship, you know, uh, that needs to be repented, then we don't give God the full access, okay, uh, for Him to come and bring that change that is needed. So another aspect for revival to come is a cry for forgiveness, a cry, cry for repentance, a cry for, um, you know, that, you know, we are sinners and that we have a holy God and that we want to be holy and righteous in his midst. Okay. So that is what we learn from Psalm 85, which is another aspect of um, revival. Okay. Repentance and crying out for forgiveness. Look at another aspect in, e in Ezra chapter 9, verses 8 to 9. All of you with me? Yes, you're able to understand you're able to uh, catch what we're saying or it's going above your head. But in lesson one, our quest means what is our quest for revival? Okay, we're talking about that. So can somebody please read Ezra chapter 9 verses 8 to 9, please? And now for a little while, grace has, grace has been shown from the Lord our God to leave us a remnant to escape and to give us a peg in his holy place that our God may enlighten our eyes and give us a measure of revival in our bondage for we were slaves, yet our God did not fors forsake us in our bondage, but he extended mercy to us in the sight of the king of Persia, to revive us, to repair the house of our God, to, re to rebuild its reins, and to give us a wall in Judah and Jerusalem. Amen. So here Ezra's cry comes after the Jews have returned to Jerusalem after their uh, exile. Okay, and they, what did they do when they come back? When they when they go back to Jerusalem, what do the Jews do? What do the Jews do when they go back from exile to Jerusalem? They repent. Okay, they repent, and what else do they do? Yes, they begin to rebuild the temple, and what uh, does Nehemiah lead them to do? To re rebuild the walls of. Jerusalem. Okay. So Ezra is saying that, you know, even as the people are rebuilding the temple and rebuilding the walls, he's saying in this rebuilding or in this repair work that they are taking about, we can see God reviving his people. Okay. So that is what Ezra is saying. He's saying in this repair work, in this rebuilding work, we can see God is reviving his people. So 
how do we apply that in our context today? Okay, the same way in the church, we see that there is a restoration. When we see that there is a restoration in the church, there is a repair of things that are broken down, you know, in our church, lives that are broken down. When we see God rebuilding, um, uh, raising up uh, spiritual truths where there has been uh, division, there has been strife, uh, God is raising up uh, healing and restoration in those areas. When there's raising up of new experiences of God, is when God is reviving his people. Okay, so that is another aspect of revival. When God is restoring, he's repairing things, things that are broken down, relationships that are ruined, or truth or false doctrine that has come into the church, and he's restoring that, he's repairing um, those things. Okay, and so there is a new raising up of a new experience of God. That's when God is reviving his people. So those are uh, uh, our ways or evidence that there is revival happening when we see restoration, when we see repair, when we see rebuilding, when we see raising up of spiritual truth and new experiences of God. There's a great uh, desire for truth to overtake all of the false doctrines and everything or the experiences of God that is happening around us. Okay. Um, so when we talk about seasons of revival, we talk about a specific period of time when there is a powerful revelation of God. Uh, so that does not mean that when the season ends, what we have experienced also ends. It does not mean that. Okay. So when we call it as a season of revival, we... Okay. It's okay. I'll be careful of it. So when we call it a season of revival, we call it because there is revelation or there is an experience of God that has come in power during that period of time. But we want that experience not to just be for that momentary time period, but we want that experience to continue to linger on. And we want that experience to take us to a new level of a revelation of God, intimacy with God, or moving to a higher ground. Now, if you see, I'm basically repeating or reiterating everything that I've been saying, okay? So we see that revival is also a time period when there is a new revelation experience of God, and it's not ending in a time period, but it's something that is an experience that will continue. That level of rev revelation will move us to higher ground, okay? So when revival happens or when the move comes, uh, revival comes to an end, so-called end, we don't fall back to where we were before, but we move to a new level, a new uh, a level of experiencing God, His glory. We keep pursuing more and more of God, more of His glory, more of His experience, more of His knowledge, and more of intimacy with Him. And it all starts with Repentance, we come to a place of repentance, that place of humility where we allow God to come in power and revive us. Okay, let's look at First Corinthians chapter 5, verse 4, and see what we can learn from that. Can somebody read First Corinthians chapter 5, verse 4, please? In the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, when you are gathered together along with my spirit, with the power of our Lord Jesus Christ. Okay. So the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, when you are gathered together along with my spirit, with the power of our Lord Jesus Christ. So the Lord Jesus must be present in power in seasons of revival. Okay, So this verse is saying that, you know, when revival happens, there should be a greater manifestation of the power of God, which is not something that we experience usually or during church services. You know, there is a greater power during the seasons of revival. There's a greater manifestation of the power like we see in the book of Acts. Okay. Where we see in the book of Acts in Acts chapter 4 verse 33. What does it say in Acts 4 33? Acts 4 33. And with great power, the apostle gave witness to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus. And great grace was upon them all. 
Yes, with great power, the apostles gave witness to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus and great grace was upon them all. So this was not the usual, not a little power, but great power and great grace was upon them. And that allowed them to move out and to be witnesses. So that is a sign of revival when there's a greater measure of the power of God and greater uh, grace. Okay, so when his power comes in a greater measure, something that we can't even think, imagine, or ask for, greater power, and then out of that flow signs, miracles, and wonders. Okay, um, so we see in the in Acts chapter five, it describes what this great power looked like. It says, through the hands of the apostles, many signs, miracles were done among the people, and they were all in one accord. Uh, so they were all in one accord and they, was, they saw great signs, miracles and wonders. So when revival happens, you know, there is great signs, miracles and wonders. And we also see great unity that is there. Okay. Any questions? Any doubts? Any questions? So we are basically on um, uh, page number two. Okay, on top of page number uh, three in your, uh, in the APC publication. Any questions? Anything that needs uh, clarity, anything that you need? So we look at, uh, we've basically looked at pages, um, the introduction and uh, page one, two, and three. We will uh, begin with page four in our next class because it's just, Okay, um, good question by Andrew. Um, being a revivalist is a call or an anointing? It's a calling or an anointing? What do you think? Be, uh, being a revivalist or God using you to birth a revival, is it a calling or an anointing? Anointing? I think it's both, right? It's a calling and an anointing. Unless you are called... Yes, thank you, Lucy. Unless you're called, you cannot uh, bring revival. And when you're called and you're pursuing God in a greater intimacy, in a greater measure, you're desiring more of him, the anointing flows. And what is the anointing? Power and the presence of the Holy Spirit. So you see the presence and the power. But to birth a revival, you basically have to be called to it. Yes. There is no calling you can't desire for that revival, pray that revival. Right? So all this, that God has used, all men and women God used, there's basically a calling for that revival. Yes, please take the mic, Nelson. Quickly, we just have two minutes. I have to go to my next class. Yeah. God has a plan for me. Supposed to change area or something else he wants to do. Hmm. But... I am not aligned with his uh, will, means mm. I'm going away from him. Mm. So in that case, God may use another person, right? Okay, like Moses' example. Yeah. Uh, we look at that in uh, the ministry of an apostle, prophet, and teacher, but I'll give you that example here. What happened to Moses? He knew in his heart, Acts says, he knew in his heart that God called him to deliver the people, but he messed up, right? Then for 40 years, he was in the wilderness taking care of sheep. He did not need leadership qualities. But did God call him again? Yes. And did he lead the people of uh, Israel? Yes. Was he uh, excited about doing it the first time and God called him in the burning bush? No. He gave a lot of excuses. But when you read Moses' story later on, when God says, hey, my presence is not going with you, God says, I'm going to wipe away all these people. What does Moses say? Yeah, God, wipe them away. You know, I'm not fed up with these people. You know, when you're so fed up with them, you know, how much more fed up I should be, you know? And, and he, he didn't say, God, you know, 
uh, when your presence is not going, I'm a human. I'm also fed up with them. You know, uh, I also not going to give me a break to somebody else. But what does Moses do? He's just pursuing the call of God. He's 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 standing in the gap and interceding. So for your question is, God can stir it up for you in your heart. Okay, God can stir it up in your heart, even if it's not your will. But if you don't desire it, and if it's not your will, yes, God will raise up somebody. He can use somebody else. Yeah. Um, yeah, God will raise another person. But uh, in that uh, situation, like where God is using another person, and if I am again willing to come back, so in that case, what? Yeah, God, God can use you again to birth a revival. Yes, why not? God never gives up on you. That is a redemptive heart and the nature of God. God says uh, God's love knows no bound and Hebrew says God saves to the uttermost. He does not give up on anybody. He will never give up on you. So he knows the plans and purposes. He will stir it up and when you're willing, he will take you and use you. Okay, thank you everyone for uh, the class. Thank you for sitting through the two hours. I hope you're revived somewhere. <laughs> okay, have a wonderful uh, day and um, Yes, God bless. Thank you. Thank you.